How many of you know that dads are known for dad jokes? I don't have any of those for you, but I have some dad puns for you. 10 puns. I think at least one of them will make you chuckle. So here we go. Two antennas met on a roof, fell in love and got married. The ceremony wasn't much, but the reception was excellent. <laughs> well, we're a good crowd. A jumper cable walks into a bar. The bartender says, I'll serve you, but don't start anything. <laughs> Two cannibals are eating a clown. One says to the other, does this taste funny to you? <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Okay. Now this one, I, I, I'm sorry. This one, you're going to have to be a boomer to appreciate. So all the boomers, you ready? Man goes to a doctor, doctor, I can't stop singing the green, green grass of home. Doctor, that sounds like the Tom Jones syndrome. Man, is it common? Doctor, well, it's not unusual. <laughs> the rest of you guys have to Google that, all right? <laughs> Two cows are standing next to each other in a field. Daisy says to Dolly, I was artificially inseminated this morning. I don't believe you, says Dolly. It's true, no bull, exclaims Daisy. <laughs> An invisible man marries an invisible woman. The kids were nothing to look at either. <laughs> Deja vu, the feeling that you've heard this bull before. <laughs> a man woke up in the hospital after a serious accident. He shouted, doctor, doctor, I can't feel my legs. The doctor replied, I know, I amputated your arms. <laughs> I don't write them, guys, I just read them. That's, uh, that's, Two Eskimos sitting in a kayak were chilly, so they lit a fire in the craft. Not surprisingly, it sank, proving once again that you can't have your kayak and heat it too. Okay, last one. A woman had twins and gives them up for adoption. One goes to a family in Egypt and is named Amal. The other one goes to a family in Spain. They name him Juan. Years later, Juan sends a picture of himself to his birth mother. Upon receiving the picture, she tells her husband she wishes she had a picture of them all. Her husband said, they're twins. If you've seen Juan. <laughs> hey, all right. Okay, how many of you, at least one of these made you chuckle? See? One pun in 10 did. Y'all are sharp. Y'all are sharp. That's it for the dad puns. Suitable for use at a barbecue. When we talk about fatherhood, it is uh, it's an interesting subject. It is something that we have, it really, I think, has become much maligned and actually has changed over the years. Uh, if, you, if you go back to television reruns back in the 50s, they had shows like um, Father Knows Best. And then you, I remember watching as a kid, watching Leave It to Beaver, where all the fathers were very buttoned up and very, very wise and very noble and, and uh, had, a, had a great reputation. In the 60s, there, there was a very interesting show called My Three Sons. And My Three Sons was about a man who was a widower and he raised three boys. But again, he was a father with a lot of, of, of integrity and wisdom and he solved problems and fathers were thought of really on a higher level. In the 70s brought us all in the family. And if you remember Archie Bunker, it began to go downhill right, right there. And, and Archie Bunker was very bigoted. He was very opinionated, didn't listen. And you begin to get a different, somebody who ever wrote, whoever wrote for that sitcom had some daddy issues because Archie really was a pretty horrible character. And then, and then later on, of course, uh, you, you had uh, Homer Simpson and, and Al Bundy. And um, there weren't too many bright spots. Actually, for a while, the Cosby Show was a bright spot on fathers. Now, not a bright spot off screen, but on screen, it was, it was considered a, a good role model. And the thing about, thing about fatherhood is, it's, again, it's, it's often maligned. It has been something that has been uh, criticized a lot. And, and it's sad because what we're seeing also 
is just one more thing of the division that you see in, in the nation. And we see it along political bounds, we see it along racial bounds, and it seems like we have a media that likes to stir it up. And you also see it even on gender bounds. And you start to hear things like toxic masculinity. And uh, I don't believe at all in toxic masculinity. I believe that men and women are different and we're wired different and that men are masculine and, and, and women are, are inherently feminine. The problem is not masculinity. The problem is selfishness and selfishness is not gender specific. Selfishness can go across the board. But you have to understand that men and women are wired different. If you do understand that, it makes it easy. I was thinking about Michael's uh, little, little kids. He's got, he's got three now, but he's got Mariah, who's five, and a little girl. And then he's got Jude, who's, who's three. And they're just different. Mariah turns everything into a baby doll or a dress. And Jude turns everything into a ball or a gun. And that's, you know, little boys, man, they'll take a sandwich and eat it and make it look like a gun and point it at people. <laughs> And you're thinking, oh, that's testosterone poisoning. No, that's being a boy. And, and just, so let the boys be boys and let the, let the girls be girls. And, you know, anyway, I, I, could, I could get on a semi-rant there, but I, I don't want to. The challenge, the challenge with fatherhood is there's just not a lot of, of scriptures that are specific to talking to fathers. And you say, well, well, if it's so important, Alan, why don't you see a lot more scriptures? Here's, here's the issue. The Bible makes a big issue out of growing in Christ-like character. If you grow in Christ-like character, it will make you a better father. It will make you a better wife. It will make you a better mother. It will make you a better boyfriend, girlfriend. It's going to make you a better person. And so the idea of growing in Christ-like character, you're going to begin to see some of those. Well, even you look at Peter who says, you know, virtue, which is moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. He said, if these things are in you and they are just overflowing in your life, they're going to make you neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they're going to make you more Christ-like in your character. That's the objective. Grow in Christ-like character and you're going to solve a lot of relational problems that are out there. But there are some verses that talk exactly to fathers. And this morning, I want, I'm going to take one, but then we're also going to look at a story that we're going to glean some information. Now, if you're thinking, okay, I'm a lady, I'm, I'm not a father, there's relational wisdom in this. And so, let, but let's look at this, this admonition to fathers right here. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Other translations say, fathers don't irritate your children or cause your children to be frustrated. One translation says to bring them up tenderly in Christian discipline and advice. So he's talking about fathers not, not irritating, not frustrating their, their kids and talks about how important that is. And, and then says, you wanna bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. The, the, one of the challenges I think with, with fatherhood and not just fatherhood, with parenting is there is no real book on how to do this. And so a lot of times what we take is we learn from our, our past, we learn from our parents or maybe lack of parents, and we bring that into, the, into our situation. And so um, I, I was listening or reading a story about a man who wrote a book called Becoming a King. It was written to men. And he interviewed a, a decorated soldier who was a special forces soldier. And this soldier was telling him, he's a warrior. He said, he said you know what? He said, my life in Afghanistan, he said, I can handle that. He said, my objectives are clear. I know what I need to do. He said, I can handle any, any adversity that comes. He said, I can take on a 300 person ambush and I know, I know how to handle that. He said, I feel like I live in Afghanistan, but then I'm deployed to Texas in my home. And he said, in my marriage, in my parenting, in my mortgage, he said, I feel like I'm failing. He said, I, I, don't, I don't have clear objectives. I, I don't know what to do. And the author of this story said something I thought was pretty interesting. He said, in marriage and in parenting, he said, are, are the most challenging places in our life to love well. Because it's the place where we have the least ability to hide. The least ability to hide away. You, you know, the thing about it is, is who you are at home is who you are. And so that's where we can't hide. 
Joy asked me yesterday, she said, uh, what, what are you preaching on Sun, uh, tomorrow, Father's Day? I said, um, stupid things I did as a dad. And uh, I was hoping that she would say, oh, no, honey, no. That, that, I think Joy was thinking that that needed to be a series. Uh, <laughs> this morning, I, I want to look at uh, a father in, in, the, in the Bible, and he's a pretty famous father. In fact, he's called the father of our faith. His name is Abraham. And I think in this one story, which is a very, it's a very dramatic story. But in this one story, we can see some things that give us wisdom in terms of, of, of fatherhood, not just fatherhood, but relations. So let's read the story. The, the story is with Abraham and his son Isaac. It said, it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to the young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, son. He said, Look at the fire. Look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. There's some interesting things in this story that we can glean about learn about relationship, learn about fatherhood. Let's look at it from a fatherhood perspective. Abraham loved Isaac. It was a, a very tangible, visible love for Isaac. Abraham and his wife Sarah had waited years for a, for a, a child. And if you know the story, this is one of, the, one of the most dramatic miracles in the Bible that actually Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was in their 90s when they had Isaac. That's, that's a miracle. You say, oh, I don't, listen. The God that created the heavens and the earth and created the universe, if he wants an old couple to have a, a, a child, that's gonna happen. Not with us, but it's going to, <laughs> but it's gonna happen. And they had Isaac. Isaac was, uh, he, he was so loved, so, so longed for, and the whole future was in Isaac. And God even referenced the fact that he loved Isaac. He said, Isaac, whom you love. And so Abraham's love for Isaac was there. Abraham and Isaac had good communication. And the reason I say that is because Isaac was able to ask him questions. Abraham was approachable. He was able to say, my, my father, I, I, got a, I got a question. I see the knife, I, I, see, the, I see the wood, I, where's the lamb? That's a good question. You know, sometimes fathers would just cut the kids off, go, that's a stupid question, don't ask that. But he answered him. And so the communication was good. Isaac, excuse me, Isaac felt like he could, he could talk to his father. He felt like he could ask questions. And Abraham was able to, to clue him in and tell him what was going on. And so he gave the best answer that he could. He said, you know, God will provide a lamb in the situation. There had to be a high level of trust between Abraham and Isaac. You say, well, why, why is that? Well, one, Isaac... At this time, scholars think he's anywhere between 10 and 17. And he would, Abraham is old. Remember, Abraham had Isaac at 100. And so but he was obviously old enough to carry the wood. So we're not talking about a four-year-old. We're talking about Abraham laid the wood on Isaac. Isaac carries the, the wood as they go up the mountain, left the other guys behind. And so Isaac was, was old enough to carry the wood. But he was old enough also to ask intelligent questions. 
But he also was old enough, if he wanted to put up a fight, he could have. If he wanted to, when he's being bound, and he, he, could, have, he could have resisted that. And Abraham being over 100 years old at this point, I don't, I don't know. Listen, I, I, I've got grandkids. I want to tell you something. Grandkids will wear you out. If you've got, all you grandparents understand what I'm talking about. There's something in little children that can suck the very life out of you. <laughs> and so here's Abraham at over 100 years old. And if Isaac had wanted to put, even if he's a, a healthy 10 year old, he could put up a fight. But he was willing to trust his, his father to the point where he allowed himself to be bound and laid on an altar. And then the last thing we see is that Abraham honored God before he honored his son. You see, if Isaac had been first in Abraham's life, he'd have never taken that trip. But by Abraham taking the trip and doing what God said, trusting that, that God was able even to raise Isaac from the dead, trusting the Lord, trusting God on this, that Isaac, Isaac was not first place in Abraham's life. God was. And so it had to be something that was part of their life because even with Isaac's understanding of sacrifice and worship, he knew what they were going to do. They were going to offer sacrifice and worship. That was something that was part of their life. Now, if, if you think the story ends there, it doesn't. Because when the angel stopped Abraham from, with the knife in his hand from killing his son and said, you know, you haven't withheld your son from me, the, the scripture said that Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in some branches, caught in a thicket. And they took the, the ram and, and offered the sacrifice of the ram. It's a pretty dramatic story. But I think in this, we can learn some things about relationship. Here's some relational wisdom we can learn. And we can learn from here. So here's the first one that we can learn from this. Love is the best thing we can give. Fathers are, are now, I, I would tell you something, this, this, is a, this is a man thing. Men, we are wired to provide. That's what we, that's what we do. We, we, we want to provide. And it's just, it's in us. We, 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 we get value from that. It's one way we show our love. But it, it's not the only way. But I want to show you an interesting scripture because oftentimes when, when fathers think about providing, it's easy to compare yourself with what other fathers have done. And you can, you can start to feel bad that you haven't provided enough. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted calf with hatred. Leave it up there. That's a little, that's a little blind. We might say it this way. Better is the dinner of vegetables where love is than a steak dinner with hatred. So what in the world has that got to do with anything? It's got to do with everything of that the environment is more important than the material goods. In this culture that this was written, uh, they, they didn't have uh, Texas Roadhouse down the street. No steak restaurants. And so eating was so important. And if you had like a, if you had a, a, a fatted calf, if you had a steak, man, that was the ultimate. That was so special. You, were, you really had something special. And so what, what the, the writer of Proverbs is saying is, it's not so much what's provided, it's, it's what is, is, is the love environment. If you have a love environment, then, and, and many of you understand this, have you ever gone out to a nice restaurant with your, with your spouse or with someone you were dating and get in an argument, you can ruin a meal. And you're like, huh, it's horrible. And Joy and, I, Joy and I figured out years ago, it wasn't the meal that was so important, it was the love, it was the fellowship that was important. So we would actually go to IHOP on New Year's Eve. There's nobody there. And uh, we had a, a meal, but we just enjoyed the time together. What a father can provide and what, and what if you're a single mom and you think I'm out of this, no, you can provide the same environment. Love is the best environment that you can provide. And I, 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 will, I will help you with this. If you are married and have children in your house right now, one of the best things you can do as a father is to love their mother. That provides such a stable environment. My, my parents stayed together, but man, they argued a lot. And I remember as a child, as a young child, that it impacted me when they were arguing. And so one of the best things you can do is just provide an atmosphere of love. And if you, boy, you have love, you got a lot. And, and here, here's one thing too. And men, it's okay to express our love for our children out loud, verbally. I love you. Saying I love you won't make them weak or soft. It will make them strong on the inside. It'll give them a sense of confidence and, and encouragement. 
so love is, 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 is a wonderful thing. Here's, here's the second one. Good communication is important. Learning how to communicate. And, and this is a lot of times, sometimes men will say, well, you know, you know, Alan, I'm not a talker. I'm just, I'm a quiet guy, which actually has huge benefits because uh, you, you don't have to repent for some of the things that you didn't say as much. But, but there does need to be communication. And the, and the scriptures actually talk about three levels of communication that fathers can provide in a home. For you know what we, that we dealt with you is each of a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Encouragement, comfort, and urging. Three levels of communication that will really help. Encouragement. Everybody needs it. Everybody needs it. If there's a YouTube channel right now by a guy named uh, Rob Kinney, it's called Dad, How Do I? Anyone ever seen that channel? Dad, How Do I? I think he started, he started right before the pandemic. And he st he, he'd raised his kids. He, he's, a, he's a great guy. He's a believer. So he started doing YouTube things on how to do things like how to tie a tie, how to change a flat tire, how to jump a car, things that often he, he find that dads would provide. He grew up in a fatherless home. His father abandoned him when he was 12 years old. And so he wanted to provide something different. He's got almost 5 million subscribers to his YouTube channel. 5 million subscribers. And one of the things he said, every time he has a birthday or in Father's Day, people are sending him stuff all the time. Not just because he shows them how to do something, but because he's very encouraging. And people need encouragement even so much that they will go on a YouTube and connect with a guy that they've never met before. And when he opens his YouTube channel up, he goes, hey kids, and people respond to that. Encouragement. If there's one area, well, there's a few areas. There's one of the areas I wish I'd done a better job as a father, was being encouraging. Second one is comforting. Comforting is so important. See, a dad can comfort? Oh yeah, a dad can comfort. Especially in times of, of duress or in times when the kids are going through something difficult. This is why we've always believed in, in allowing kids to deal with things when they're in school and high school and stuff because when they come back under our environment, we can help them walk through it. And so oftentimes comfort. Now, I'll be quite honest with you. Joy is better at comforting than, than I am. So usually when the kids want comfort, they go to joy. But just, just last week, I got a call from my daughter. She's 38 years old. She called me. She was crying. And she said, Dad, she said, the little dog, Charlie, we bought is so sick and we actually have to give him back to the, uh, to the breeder. And it's been in the family for six months and everybody, and she's crying on the phone. She said, I knew I could call you because mom doesn't care about dogs. And so that, <laughs> and, and she's exactly right. I mean, I'm tearing up, listening to her having to give the dog back and we're like, oh my dog. And I, but I, I'm comforting my daughter and comfort is something that, man, it, it, it's such a hell. <laughs> She, uh, of course, my daughter is the one who can, who can give it to me. Anybody remember the movie Taken with Liam Neeson? We, we watched that. I think one of the reasons that that movie resonated so much and even Joy sat through the violence is because it was a father going after his daughter and protecting his daughter. By the way, that's another thing that's in men. We tend to want to protect. And so we're a protector. And I remember after the movie, Christine looked over me. She said, I wish I had a dad like that. <laughs> I looked at her and I said, if you did have a dad like that, you're, I'd be in jail because your last boyfriend would be walking with a permanent limp. I said, that is, that is, that is, that is I have a particular set of skills. And so, uh, <laughs> but the idea of comfort, the idea of comfort from a father, yeah, and, and listen, comfort is needed as, as well. The last one is, is urging. So we have encouragement, we have comfort, and we have urging. Urging, I was better at urging. Urging is do right, let's go, come on. It's the, it's the, it's the encouragement, it's the, let's get this right. Look a man in the eye, shake his hand, stand up straight, wipe your mouth, say yes ma'am. No, that's the urging that you see in the Father. We went out one time when we were walking as a family, went hiking up in um, Sam Houston State Park and we were just walking down the trail. Michael, our youngest, Michael was kindergarten and he evidently had a teacher in kindergarten who was like very into organic stuff. And so Michael 
Michael runs up to this tree and hugs this tree and kisses this tree. And I'm like, uh, okay. But then we're walking further and he's hugging every tree on the path. And this is when the dad in me comes up. I'm like, hey, stop hugging the trees. <laughs> we're not raising tree huggers around here. We like trees, but we're not tree huggers. You can forget that. That's urging as I was urging. But, but that's, that's what we can do. Three, three levels of communication. Here's the third one. Trust is vital to any good relationship. Trust is vital to any good relationship. Let me give you some, just, just function. Now, this, this applies across the board, but it also applies to, uh, to fathers. I, uh, my dad's in heaven now. I love my dad. He was a good man. He was a moral man. My father and I were not close. And even up into our later years, we, we weren't close. And I'm sorry about that because obviously I had something to do with that. But one of the things that my father was not was he was not approachable. In other words, if I had a question, or if I had something that, that disagreed with something in him, I couldn't bring it up. And if you're going to develop trust, especially as children get older, you have to be approachable. They've got to at least be able to go, hey, I've got a question here. Hey, why do we do this? Or hey, why are you doing that? So being approachable is key and it's helpful in relationships. If you're without overreacting, you can ask me a question, we can talk about it. It's real challenging, I know, when parents have older kids to start questioning their faith, but this is the time to help them. This is the time to show them why you believe what you believe. This is the time to guide them through. Second one is that if you're gonna develop trust, you, you need to be able to be a person that you do what you say. If you do what you say, then that has great value. The third thing would be to align your actions and your words together. It's interesting when, when, people, come, when people come and start working for us, new staff. <clears throat> a lot of times we get, we get staff, not all the time, but we get staff from a large church. We got a lot of wonderful volunteers. And so we, we often get staff from our volunteer base. And one of the things that, that our, our new staff members say is when someone goes from being a volunteer to working on our staff, the, one of the key questions they ask this new staff member, other people, is what are they like to work with? You know, and they're talking about me enjoying. What are they like to work with? In other words, is what I see here, does it work back there? Is it congruent? Do their words and their actions line up? Now, I always thought that's a, that's a fascinating question, but that's one of the number one questions that people ask. What do they like to work with? Words and actions that line up and listen. And when our words and actions don't line up, then the best thing we can do is step up and go, I apologize. I'm sorry. I missed it. Apologies coming from fathers are powerful. If you look at your children and go, I made a mistake here. I apologize, I ask you to forgive me. That's how trust is developed and trust is built. Here's the last one. It's maybe the most important one. Put God first in your life. Put God first. Michael, who, who works with our young people, and I were talking about some articles that have come out and they talked about the teenagers who are turning to Christ now. And what they're finding is there's two groups of teenagers that really turn to Christ. One group is teenagers where their home life, Jesus is not in the home at all. They're, they're coming out of a home life where no one honors the Lord. And, and we see them on Wednesday nights. They keep coming in on Wednesday nights. They keep getting saved. Michael said, they're some of the most hungry kids because what they have at home is not working. So they come. He said, but the, but the second group are the parents that live it. He said, the, the parents that live with their kids typically are, are, have, a, have a heart for the Lord, have a hunger for the Lord. Living it is so important. And if you can put God first, you say, well, does that mean I have to quit my job and work for the ministry? No, no. It's, it's a function of priorities. Who am I going to serve? How are we going to run this family? How are we going to do this? Joshua said something I thought was powerful. He's talking to the nation of Israel. He said, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, 
whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's a great phrase, fathers, if you get a hold of. If you're a single mom or a single father, grab a hold of that. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That, what's that mean? That means that you begin to set the guidelines. You set the, you set the tone for your family. We're going to serve God. I've had parents that honestly have looked at me and they said, well, you know, Alan, I just, I, I don't want to brainwash my kids. I'm just going to let them make their own decision. Are you kidding me? When it comes to their eternal salvation, I'm going to wash their little brains as much as I can because I, I want them in heaven with me. We're not talking about political parties here. We're talking about their eternal salvation. And so, I'm going to make a lot of friends with this, but listen to me for this. I set the tone in our family, even before I was a pastor, this is what we're going to do. We're going to serve God. We're going to do this as a family. But I've told Joy for years, I am perfectly willing to be unpopular for years in my own home if it turns out good for them in the end and making the long run. And so I am, um, don't send me emails, my mind's made up. I'm here to be their father first, not their friend. When they leave the home, now we have the friendship. Now we have that. I'm still their father. I still get the calls when the dogs go away. But I'm still, but I'm, I'm the father. But, I, but I'm, I'm not trying to, especially when they're in the home, I'm not trying to be their friend, guys. If you're trying to be their friend, you're going to have a conflict. Because at some point in time, you're going to have to put your foot down and go, this is the way it's going to be. And that doesn't make you the most popular. But if you do it for the right reasons, and you do it to honor God, it is wisdom in the long run. When Abraham lifted his, his hand to kill Isaac with the knife, and the Lord spoke to him and said, Abraham, I know you fear God because you didn't withhold Isaac. You didn't withhold him from it. And he understood that even as much as Isaac was loved by Abraham, Abraham loved God more. So what an amazing thing that when God put his son on the cross, he did not withhold his son from us. That he allowed his son to be crucified. He allowed his son to be beaten. He allowed his son to actually suffer a horrible death, to go to hell in our place, to be raised from the dead that we might have a life with him. Do you realize how much of a loving heavenly father we have? He did not withhold his son. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The free gift he offers is salvation. The free gift he offers is heaven. The free gift he offers is a place in his kingdom and it's available to everyone. Would you bow your head for a moment? If you came today or you're watching online and you say, you know what, Alan, I, I don't have a relationship with the Lord. I know that. He knows that. I want that to change. Or maybe you're saying, I, I'm sitting here and I realize I've gotten away from God and I know it, but I want to come back where well, the wonderful news is he is so amazingly merciful and his arms are open still. Heads are bowed, knives are closed. We're going to say a prayer. If either one of those situations applies to you, I want you to listen to me. We're going to say this prayer. I'm not going to have you stand up. I'm not going to have you come to the front. But if this prayer is for you and you say, Alan, would you pray for, for me? I want to be a part of this prayer. Would you slip your hand up quickly across this auditorium? And say, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate your courage. You can put your hands down. We're going to pray. If you're online, obviously, I can't see you, but you can pray this prayer. We're going to pray with you as a church family. We, listen, all of us have had to come to the place where we make this decision. And so no one's judging you here. We're glad that you're doing this. So let's pray this prayer together. Say, dear God. I know mankind needs a savior. I know I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And God raised you from the dead. Right now, I confess you as my Lord, as my savior, as the one who forgives me and restores me. Thank you, Jesus. My past is forgiven. I have a relationship with you. I'm a new creation in Christ because I've said yes to you. Now with heads bowed just for a moment. Father, thank you for those who prayed that prayer. Thank you for those who've come back to you, those who've received you for the very first time here and also watching online. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are such a good father to them, the best ever. And we give you all the praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.